each of us gathered here today, whether you're here in person or whether you're with us online, each of us is telling a story, right? Our lives are stories with beginnings, middles, and ultimately ends. I might start my story by saying that a boy was born in the year 1982 in Richmond, Virginia. Most of you would start your story differently, a different time, a different place, but we each have a beginning to our story, right? And then that middle of the story. We hope the middle of our story is really long, right? But eventually, we know, our stories come to an end. This beginning, this middle, and this end, there's a narrative, there's a trajectory to our lives. And each of us is writing that story every day that we live. Another sentence, another paragraph in that story that we're writing. But it's actually a little bit more complicated than this, isn't it? Because when I arrived in 1982, the world had been around for quite a while. And indeed, even my story was shaped by events that occurred before I was born. Not just the lives of my parents, although that's the most obvious thing, but everything that happened, the whole history of the world, the whole history of the universe, shaped the moment that I was born. And the same is true for each one of us. In the early 16th century, some people left Southwest England and traveled to North America. That was centuries before I was born, but that had a huge impact on my story. They were ancestors of mine from England. If they hadn't left, I wouldn't begin my story by saying I was born in Richmond, Virginia. For better or for worse, we don't begin our individual stories at the beginning. 1982, Richmond, Virginia is not really my beginning. I'm dropped into the middle of this bigger story that's going on. And that's true for each one of us. All of our stories are really more like small chapters in a much, much larger book. The beginning of my story is actually the middle of that bigger story. Authors have a term for stories that start right in the middle. It's called beginning your story en media res, which is Latin for in the midst of things. And that's really how life is, right? That's how life starts, not at the beginning, but in the midst of things. Starting a story this way, if you're actually reading a book or watching a movie, can be deeply confusing. What's going on? Who are these characters? Where did they come from? And where is this story going? That's actually how life works. We're dropped into the middle of an extremely complex narrative. And I have to figure out what is going on. Our little stories are just tiny slivers of this much, much larger one. Now, our faith tells a certain story about that big picture narrative, right? We tell a story that begins at the beginning, like the beginning of beginnings. A story of God creating the world out of love and God, God creating the world in order that the world can love. We tell a story then, however, of that world falling apart, stumbling, evil and suffering entering in the world. But then we tell a continuing story of God not abandoning the world to that evil and suffering, but rather continually working in the world to try and save, try and perfect it. That's the way we tell the big overarching story. Not everyone tells the story that way, of course. But that's ultimately what scripture is trying to tell us. It's trying to help us fit ourselves into this much wider narrative of life. In order to understand the story we've been dropped into, we have to look beyond the present. We have to look outside of our little chapter. We have to look to the past and to the future. Now, our passage from the letter to the Hebrews today begins by pointing us to the past. We were reading from chapter 11 from the letter to the Hebrews last week as well. And this chapter focuses us on all these stories, stories from the past, stories of people of faith. Last week, we heard mostly about Abraham and Sarah, the story of their family. 
Today we hear about the story of the Israelites passing through the Red Sea, the story of Rahab helping the Israelites in their wars in Canaan. And then all these other characters, some well-known, others not so much. Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel. We hear about all these different stories, or I guess chapters of the story. People of faith. And what the letter to the Hebrews tells us is that these people lived in faith because of a promise God made them. There's a covenant. God promised them something, and so they lived in faith to God because of that promise. And that all makes sense until we come up to the sort of the last little paragraph that you'll see on page five in your bulletin, right? We're told that though these people were commended for their faith, they did not receive what was promised. Now, this is a strange moment. The whole chapter has been telling us that, look, these people live by faith because the promise God made them. And then we're told, but they didn't receive what was promised. The promise wasn't fulfilled. Is scripture telling us that God is a liar? That God makes promises and then doesn't keep them? Well, no. But it's definitely an odd moment. If you just pause there, there's something strange going on. Why would the promise not be fulfilled? This is where the author pivots from the past to the future, looking before our chapter to looking after our chapter. The author goes on to say that God has provided something better so that they, all these people in the past, they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. The promise that God has made to all these people still stands. It hasn't been fulfilled because ultimately its fulfillment involves not just those individuals, but everyone, past, present, and future. We are heirs to the promises made to those who came before us. But the promise, as we look around, the promise of a world that has been healed, a promise of a world of peace and compassion, the promise of a world that actually lives God's love, still hasn't been totally fulfilled, right? You just have to watch the news to confirm that. We are heirs to the promise, but the promise hasn't been fulfilled in our chapter either. As I try to understand my story, my little chapter, I have to understand that my chapter is part of that larger narrative, and the meaning of my story, the meaning of my life, is tied to those who came before me and those who will come after. We are not at the beginning or the end of the story. And the promises that God makes to people are not made to individuals. That's ultimately what the letter to the Hebrews is telling us. God doesn't promise me something and you something else. God rather promises all of humankind something. The salvation, the perfection that I seek is not for me alone. It is only if all people, and indeed all things, can be healed and perfected, that I can hope for salvation. In other words, we're all in this together, and it ain't over until it's over. This perfection, this healing, this salvation, we say, as people of faith, is what the whole cosmos is pointed to, what God is at work trying to do in our midst. And so until the promise can be fulfilled for everyone and everything, it's just not fulfilled. The present is caused by the past, and it's drawn towards the future, and the meaning of past, present, and future are all tied together. And indeed, the letter to the Hebrews goes on. If you turn your page over to the top of page 6, the end of chapter 11 and the beginning of chapter 12 of the letter to the Hebrews, you'll see the authors say this. In referring to those who have gone before, those who have died, we hear this. We are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Those who have gone before us, those who have died, haven't disappeared, and nor have they gone somewhere else. No, Scripture tells us that we are somehow mysteriously, invisibly, impossibly surrounded by them. 
the souls of those who have died return to the spirit that gave them life and that gives us all life. And somehow they are with us, still waiting for the fulfillment of the promise. Because until the promise is fulfilled for us and for all those who will come after us, it's not fulfilled for those in the past either. It ain't over until it's over. Just last week, or I believe it was two weeks ago, we heard this same author tell us that God's will for the world is that Christ is all and in all, that somehow God's presence will completely suffuse our lives, that that loving spirit will completely saturate the whole universe. That's the goal. Not that a few lucky individuals or people who happen to join the right club at the right time get to go to a special place, know that everything is saved, transformed, perfected, that Christ is all and in all. As people of faith, as Christians, this is the end of the story that we hope for, that we're working for, that God has promised. Our story is not ours alone. Our fates are linked to everyone else's fate. Our God is not the God of this people or that people, but of all people, of all creation. And God's love is not for this person or that person, but for all people. Full stop. God is working for the salvation, the liberation of everything. So the question we have to ask ourselves then is, what part will we play in this story, right? What work will our chapter do? Will we be a hero of the story? Will we turn out to be a villain in the story? Well, I think probably the answer for most of us is neither of these things, right? Most of us will be neither famous nor infamous. If we're honest, a lot of us end up kind of being side characters in the big story, right? And that's okay, because it's one story. We're all a part of that. The past is yearning for a better future, and that better future is drawing us forward. But we have to make decisions that either help us move there or get in the way. Each sentence we write, each paragraph we write, shapes our chapter. And our chapters either move the story closer to God's preferred ending or farther away. How we live our lives shapes the story in a small but real way. Our little chapter is a pivot point. Each one of us gets to have that little impact on the future. How we talk to each other. How often we give things to each other. How often we make space for each other. How we choose to spend our time and how we choose to spend our money and how we choose to spend our votes. All of these decisions we make in life, day to day, week to week, month to month, help to shape not just our chapter, but that big story that we're all telling with God. The Holy Spirit and that cloud of witnesses is urging us, I think, to write our chapter to bring us closer to God's preferred future. A world dominated not by violence and exploitation and selfishness and deception, but compassion and love and solidarity and honesty. We're being asked to bring the world a little closer to God's dream for us, to help make it possible that God's promise can be fulfilled. We have to decide how to respond to that call, what kind of future we want to build together. My hope for us is that God will grant us the courage and the wisdom to write our chapter boldly, that each of us as individuals and all of us together will choose to tell a story of how the world finally welcomed God's love. My friends, may it be so. Amen.